Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. I would ask everyone here in-house to make that courtesy check that your cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. Always appreciated by our speakers as well as the many cameras that are recording our events today. We will post the program within 24 hours on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. And of course, our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our program today is Walter Lohman, director of our Asian Studies Center. He also serves as an adjunct professor at Georgetown <coughs> University, where he leads a graduate seminar on American foreign policy interests in Southeast Asia. Prior to joining us here, he served as Senior Vice President and Executive Director at the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. He has also served as a Republican Professional Staff Member for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as well as an advisor to Senator John McCain. Please join me in welcoming Walter Lohman. Walter? Thank you, John. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming out. It's good to see so many friends here. I especially want to recognize Kumi Yokoe. Welcome her back to Heritage. We, we miss her so much. Uh, it's good just to see her one more time, and I'm hoping we'll continue to see her here. Um, the uh, discussion today is particularly on uh, U.S.-Japan-South Korea relations. It's uh, quite topical, I don't need to tell you. Um, uh, Senator Mint, our new president, actually not that new anymore, over a year, year old, um, and I just visited uh, South Korea and Tokyo and talked quite a bit about the relationship between the two of them and the relationship that they share with us. Um, I know it's something that he is intensely interested in, and in fact, he would be here today to uh, to uh, to host this program and to welcome uh, Mr. Kawamura uh, were he in town, but he's not in town, and he sends his, his regrets that he's not here to, to see you. Um, we've got dear friends on both sides of these issues, both in Korea and Japan. Um, I should say on both responsible sides of the issues. I think there are fringes on in both countries uh, that we don't find much sympathy with. Um, but, uh, but our main interest here as Americans, as people interested in American policy, is to see that the two sides can work together to, if not solve the various problems they have in their relationships, in, in the, the Japan-South Korea relationship, then to at least manage them in a way that allows them to focus on, on bigger priorities and, and things that are, that are actually more important to the present and to, to the future. It's a real honor to have with us today Diet Member Takeo Kawamura to lead our discussion. He is, uh, he's been a Diet Member since 1990, elected eight times over that period. Uh, he is today one of the most influential, um, if not the single most influential member of the Diet. He has served in uh, several positions, Diet positions, LDP party positions, and, and government positions including, most notably, I should point out, that he was Chief Cabinet Secretary in Prime Minister Aso's administration. At the same time, at that time of particular interest today, he was, he was also minister in charge of the abduction issue. Um, that might be something that comes up in the conversation, I imagine. So with that, uh, let me again say what an honor it is to have Mr. Kawamura here with us today. We greatly appreciate his, uh, his making heritage a part of his his schedule while he is in Washington, and I, I welcome him and, and uh, offer him the, the podium. Thank you. It is a great honor for me to have this opportunity to speak at the Heritage Foundation. I served as Chief Cabinet Secretary under Prime Minister Aso. I have been a member of Parliamentary Association for Japan-Korea Relationship. Korea has always been one of my major interests throughout my political life. Today, I'm going to talk about Japan-Korea relationship. First of all, I would like to say that Japan needs Korea as a strategic partner 
and the close friend. Let me give you three reasons for that. First, it's economy. Korea has achieved great economic development through 1970s and 1980s. We should remember that it was a miracle Korea stood up from ashes left by devastating Korea war. This is called the miracle of Hangang. Korea now proudly among G20 nations. We are talking about Sony and Panasonic 10 years ago. But today, people buy the product of Samsung and LG. Its vibrant economy is now the locomotive for all the Asia Pacific region. We need Korea to make Asian Pacific region more in integrated and prosperous with high standard rules for the 21st century type free market. Second is the security. Now Korea has become a major power and a key partner among allies of the United States. The US had five allies in the Asia Pacific region, namely Japan, Korea, Australia, Philippines, and Thailand. In the Northeast Asia, Japan and Korea are the two major allies of the US. Korean forces count 640,000 soldiers with very sophisticated weapons. It is the biggest army in the Northeast Asia only after the Chinese army. And their Air Force and Naval Forces are ranked high in the list of the regional powers. Third is the political leadership. More and more newly industrialized nation arriving on a global scale. A major power shift is just happening in front of eyes. We have to uphold the common ideals with likely-minded countries. This is a responsibility of mainstreamers particularly the responsibility of the traditional industrial democracies. We have to uphold ideals like freedom, democracy, rule of law, free market, and self-determination. Korea has proudly joined the club of industrial democracies in 1987 after the fall dictatorship and democratization of Korea. Korean democratization were, was even before the emergence, the emergence of new democracies in Eastern Europe or ASEAN after the end of the Cold War. <clears throat> It is also only seven years after the end of the last dictatorship in Spain in 1975 with the fall of Franco. Korea is now among the leaders who uphold the ideas of mainstream powers such as freedom and democracy. With these reasons, I stress again, Japan needs Korea as a main partner and as one of the responsible leaders in the Asia Pacific region. Now, let me turn to the importance of the trilateral cooperation 
among Japan, the United States, and Korea. The triangular cooperation of Japan-U.S. Korea would open the gate for a new tremendous strategic momentum. The population of the nations amount to 470 million. The economic size of the three national economies is roughly three times bigger than that of China. Even the number of soldiers of the three nation, nation forces combined is even slightly bigger than that of Chinese PLA. And I would say again that these three nations are the only three advanced industrial democracies in the Asia Pacific region. We are responsible together for freedom, democracy, and prosperity through the cooperation and the reason. In particular, we have the common cause to be united with regards to North Korea. Unlike South Korea, North Korea has failed to build a robust economy and a mature civil society. On the contrary, North Korea is developing nuclear bombs and ballistic missiles, while people are starving and living in a miserable situation. It is, it is estimated the two million starved to death in 1990s. If you look at the satellite picture of East Asia at night, South Korea looks like an island, for there is no light in the part of North Korea. North Korean people have no human rights or even no hope. Denuclearization and eventual unification of the Korean Peninsula as strategic goals shared by Japan and Korea. To realize this, again, the triangular cooperation among Japan, Korea, and the United States is inevitable. When we are united, nobody could take us lightly. And when we are separated, there is no way to influence North Korea. Let me touch upon the Japanese abductee issue here. The government of Japan has started talk with Pyongyang about the through investigation of the abductees who are kidnapped by the North Korean agents. To take them back is promise that Prime Minister Abe made with Japanese people. We will make it and take all them back. In this connection, Japan will take close contact with the United States. Finally, let me touch upon the issues of history. It is true that relationship between Japan and Korea is not easy today. But I believe that was overcome the that we can overcome the dark past and look to the bright future together. There are presidents, Prime Minister Obuchi and President Kim Dae-jung, together made a golden age of Japan-Korea relationship in the late 1990s. The cultural exchange started, and the Korean TV drama became overwhelmingly popular in Japan. 
more than five million tourists now travel back and forth between Japan and Korean Peninsula. I have to mention here that in 2011, when big earthquake and tsunami hit Japan, Korean people raised for billion yen to help Japanese people hit by the disaster. In the city of Seoul, there were banners saying, cheer up Japan, stand up Japan. These slogans were written in Japanese language. The Japanese will never forget this for a long, long time. Today, unfortunately, there remain some salient issues, such as so-called comfort women issue. I wish to let you know the Prime Minister Hashimoto, Obuchi, Mori, and Koizumi wrote letters for apology and handed five million yen, five thousand dollars to 61 comfort women who came out and were willing to receive them. The money was largely government funded, but there were also big contributions from Japanese people. The effort to overcome difficulties stemming from the past should be tango. No one can dance tango in sorrow. We should have leadership and courage to overcome the difficulties and look to the future together. And in this respect, I should say that American cooperation and the French are very helpful. The US government has been making effort so that the triangular relationship would become more robust and the dialogue between Tokyo and Seoul would become smoother and easier. I assure you that Japan appreciate that and Japan will try to make utmost effort for the future of Japan-US Korea. I believe that the success of the triangular relationship is essential, not only for Japan and Korea, but also for the all the countries in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kawamura. That's an excellent start to the discussion. Um, I wanted to uh, now turn the podium over to Bruce Klingner. Bruce is going to um, make some commentary in, in reference to uh, uh, Kawamura's uh, speech. Um, Bruce, uh, as, as you may know, is a senior fellow here at uh, Heritage Foundation for Northeast Asia. He covers Japan and Korea for us. He's been doing that for about seven years now. Uh, before that, he was 20 years with the intelligence services, CIA and DIA, including stints as chief of CIA's Korea branch and the deputy division chief for Korea, also at CIA. So with that, let me invite Bruce up to make some comments, and then we're going to open it up to, to Q&A. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Walter, and, and thank you, Representative Karamura, for your, your comments pointing out not only the importance of the South Korean-Japanese relationship, but uh, offering some ideas on how to move forward. Um, I will offer an admittedly U.S. viewpoint. Um, when looking towards Asia from Washington, we see that there are security issues and that there are history issues. And while both are very important, they are separate. Now, conversely, the view from Asia is that the two issues are intertwined <clears throat> and one cannot focus on the present or the future without first uh, addressing or resolving the past. And, and really, the, the viewpoint or the difference in viewpoint is like two people looking into each end of a telescope. When you look from one end, the image is enlarged. 
But looking from the other end, the image is much, much smaller. And I think that reflects the difference in perspectives between the view from Asia and the view from Washington. Now, first of all, we look at things from the, the viewpoint of our national interests and the threats to them. So when looking towards the Western Pacific, first of all, Washington sees the critical importance of Asia to our own national interests. Uh, trade, diplomacy, security, all of these are wrapped tightly together from a U.S. viewpoint. So consequently, control of Asia uh, by a hostile power or even regional instability threatens the foundations of American economic and security interests. And right now, unfortunately, Asian stability is currently threatened by North Korea's growing military capabilities, China's increasingly assertive behavior, long-standing sovereignty disputes, historic animosities, and rising nationalism. And since there's no regional organization similar to NATO or the European Union, um, the U.S. has proved to be the only nation that has both the capabilities and the historic record necessary to assume the role of a regional balancer and an honest broker. But the U.S. cannot do it alone. And so we've relied on friends and allies uh, to assume their, their role, their responsibility uh, for their own defense as well as addressing common security threats. And for that reason, Washington welcomed Japan's, what we would see as long overdue, intent to implement collective self-defense. Now, much has been written about collective self-defense in the last several months, and much of it is wrong. Uh, to boil the issue down to some of the basics, collective self-defense has long been discussed within Japan, and Washington has long urged Tokyo to pull more of its own weight for its own defense and to address broader security issues. And Japan in the past has been criticized for largely ineffective contributions to UN peacekeeping operations due both to the lack of collective self-defense and overly restrictive rules of engagement. Now the issue was given new energy and new emphasis in response to China's belligerent and aggressive actions, not only in the East China Sea, but in the South China Sea. So really, collective self-defense and broader Japanese defense reforms are driven more by Chinese nationalism rather than Japanese nationalism. Now, in a Japanese context, collective self-defense seems monumental, uh, given Tokyo's decades-long lethargy in responding to changes in the Asian security environment. But from a U.S. viewpoint, the change is still quite small. Um, and that even if Japan fully implements the 15 scenarios that are being discussed, it's still disappointingly inadequate in light of the North Korean, Chinese, and international security threats. Now, wide, contrary to widespread mischaracterizations, uh, really a careful reading of Japanese defense documents show that there's nothing threatening in collective self-defense, in their new national defense program guidelines, in the national security strategy, and the proposed military intelligence sharing agreement called a JISOMIA. And there's nothing that indicates Japanese intent to put boots on the ground on the Korean Peninsula, uh, as has been depicted in Korean media. And indeed, the Japanese government has repeatedly declared that any involvement in Korean missions would require Seoul's permission. Now, as the U.S. and its partner face these growing security threats in Asia, Washington is extremely troubled by the strained relations between our two critical allies in Northeast Asia, Japan and South Korea. So at a time when there should be greater cooperation amongst the three nations, unfortunately we see there is less cooperation. And this, of course, brings us to the difficulties uh, caused by the lingering history issues. Um, as philosopher George Santayana famously said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. But I would offer a corollary that those who refuse to atone for the past and those who refuse to forget the past are doomed to endlessly repeat it and put their own future at risk. During the past year, I've had many, many, many meetings with South Korean and Japanese legislators, government officials, and members of the media. And a common refrain, for, for, refrain was, take my country's side 100%. But it's not that simplistic, and the U.S., quite frankly, sees fault in both countries' approach. Let me first turn to the Japanese actions during World War II and the Korean occupation. The evidence of, of these actions uh, during 1910 and 1945 is unequivocal and overwhelming. And for anyone in Japan to question these actions or Tokyo's responsibility for them is historically inaccurate and morally re reprehensible. 
it is equally indefensible to seek to minimize the scope of those actions by debating the numbers, such as how many were killed in Nanking, or disputing details of testimony by the women forced into sexual slavery. And it is inc incomprehensible to Americans why anyone in Japan would try to um, even provide the appearance of minimizing the responsibility, since after all, those actions were taken by a Japanese regime that has now been irreversibly replaced by a democratic system. Historic issues would not still be issues if Tokyo had more forthrightly and repeatedly atoned for the past. Unfortunately, successive Japanese administrations have undermined the attempts at reconciliation by adopting a, a minimalist, often legalistic approach. And if Tokyo wants to move beyond the history issues in order to fulfill its own policy objectives and play a more effective regional and global role, it, it must make a concerted systemic effort to alleviate its neighbors' concerns. So I would offer for Tokyo that it should establish a reconciliation pro process to include, at a minimum, official, unequivocal, and repeated affirmations of the Kono and Murayama statements, if not issue a new, more expansive statement, to establish a mutually agreed upon mechanism with Seoul for compensating surviving comfort women, a pledge by the Prime Minister not to revisit Yasukuni Shrine, and to condemn and distance the government from any revisionist statements by Japanese politicians. But for historic issues to become water under the bridge, both Japan and South Korea must make better efforts to build a bridge of reconciliation. So for its part, Seoul should realize that Japan is critical for its own defense, uh, for the defense of the Korean Peninsula, and the US cannot defend South Korea without Japan. The seven U United Nations command-designated bases provide critical strike and logistics capability for a def uh, defense of the Republic of Korea. And Japan would also provide critical logistics and sea lane protection capabilities during any conflict in Korea. So for its part, Seoul should compartmentalize and prioritize its security policy and its foreign policy. It should exercise pragmatic leadership by not allowing nationalism to impede security policies necessary for the defense of Korea. It should articulate a framework for resolving these contentious issues by defining specific steps and or language that would enable Seoul and Tokyo to move forward rather than continuing amorphous demands for sincerity. And in that sense, the, the recent review of the Kono Statement, while there's much to criticize about it, I think the fact that Seoul and Tokyo coordinated uh, on language and steps forward it, it sh should actually serve as a model for the future rather than be a source of condemnation. Uh, also, Seoul should offer Tokyo assurance that it will publicly accept, accept when Japan takes steps forward towards reconciliation. And, and in essence, Seoul should adopt a trust politique policy with Tokyo. Now, the real threat, the United States has its own troubled history with Japan. But, and so that shows that history is important but which history? The history of the last century or of the history of the 70 years since the end of World War II? Now, South Koreans discern future uh, Japanese intentions based on the Japanese actions during 1910 and 1945, while Americans tend to base their perceptions on actions from 1945 to today, as well as present day evidence. Now, some have perceived and even ascribed to the Japanese government secret plans and intentions to resurrect 1930s militarism. This view has no basis in fact. Some have even speculated that if the U.S. were to abrogate its treaties with Japan and South Korea, if we were to remove all our troops from the Western Pacific, that Japan would then be emboldened to act. And to, to get into such hypotheticals is to delve into the nonsensical. Now, it's puzzling to Americans that South Korea is more worried about a hypothetical Japanese military threat than the very real threat from North Korea. South Korean polls show Japan is considered to be a security threat second only to North Korea, and indeed in some polls, the Japanese threat is seen as a bigger threat than that from North Korea. Um, you know, I think it's clear that North Korea is the real threat. North Korea is the one that on a daily basis threatens Seoul with nuclear annihilation, which insults its president. Um, and has conducted acts of war and acts of terror uh, since 1945. 
It's also troublesome to Americans to see that during the past year, there's been a new theme prevalent in the South Korean media. And even in my private conversations with numerous South Korean members of the National Assembly. So it's asserted that uh, because of these history issues and what's perceived as U.S. encouragement to uh, Japanese remilitarization, that South Korea now feels more comfortable with China or may even feel it has to choose between China and the United States in the future. Really? I think you, you, know, you can ask a long list of rhetorical questions, but I'd only ask you know, which country fought for and against Korea during the Korean War. So in conclusion, I would repeat that history is important, but we should focus on the proper history and that it must not hold the present or the future hostage. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Well, I'd like to open it up to questions, but before I do that, I'd like to invite Mr. Kawamura to see if he has any further comments um, in response to Mr. Klingner's uh, speech. Is there anything else you would like to say before we open up to questions? ま、やっぱり日本日米韓の同盟関係がやっぱ基本になるということ。それから日本とやっぱ韓国との関係はもちろんその同盟関係が前段ではあるけど、日本と韓国の間でお互いにまだ努力の必要があるという指摘私も uh, after listening to the, uh, the lecture right now, uh, I understand the importance of Japan, United States, and Korean, Korea, um, of course, on the basis of uh, ally relationship. And as for the bilateral Japan and Korea, there is, of course, ally uh, relationship. But I also agree with him that we need to put more effort in this relationship. <laughs>限定的な集団的自衛権、限定用に閣議決定をいたしました。これについて、いろんな見解がいますけれども、日本としては、日本の安全保障体制の確立という面、今の時代にあった形として、我々当然のことであろうと、こう思っております。またそのことは敷いては
So beginning, I think, in the autumn, the U.S. decided it, it did have to get more involved. And at first there was sort of question about what we should do, what role the U.S. should do. Um, and, it, and what we have, what the United States government has been doing is more behind the scenes. Um, some pretty frank messages to both Tokyo and Seoul. And I think that was the reason we saw the, what eventually led to the, the trilateral summit between President Obama and President Park and, and Prime Minister Abe. So the U.S. is trying to, uh, to counsel Tokyo and uh, counsel Prime Minister Abe um, to take steps forward on a historic issue, to sort of adopt a diplomatic Hippocratic oath, the first do no harm, and try to move forward. And also there has been a message to Seoul to, as I said, compartmentalize and prioritize it. So I think the U.S. does have to be involved. It's in all of our interests to, to have the trilateral relationship improved as well as the bilateral. Um, and I, but I think the best role for the U.S. is to, to be involved quietly and behind the scenes. It's sort of a management technique of you praise in public and you criticize in private. And so I think that's what has been done, and I think it's been effective to some degree, but it, it, the U.S. Can, does have to stay involved. I think you have pointed out a very important point. And as for this uh, United States role from quietly in the background, given uh, advice and caution to Japan and Korea, I understand this as well. But what's worse is for, for reasons, right now it is not possible for the leaders of the two countries to have a, a meeting and have a discussion. And I think this is very bad. え、when I understand that uh, each side has its say on this issue, but to, uh, next year it will be 2015. It will be the 50th anniversary from the uh, treaty with Japan and Korea that brought about the uh, diplomatic relationship, and also 70 years since the end of World War II. And therefore, I think we have to definitely work towards normalization. And these are the uh, issues that are being discussed in the policy circles, politics circles, but I think it is also start to expand to uh, discussion among citizens themselves. あの、and also in terms of the Japan-Korean relation, there are uh, groups within our diet, and I'm in responsible for that group, and there are similar groups are within the uh, Korean government as well, and, uh, and they seem to be a, a exchange between the two very often. And the subject matter that should be most important is, of course, the summit meeting of the two countries. あの、先週韓国のマスコミ、主要マスコミ、テレビ、新聞の支出クラスが日本に見えまして、それで総理官邸で安倍首相に会っております。Last week uh, main media from Korea uh, at the uh, 
from TV to newspapers, and they have met with the Prime Minister Abe at his residency. いつも供給を開いて話すようがあるということでですね。間接的にパクネ大統領に呼びかけを行っておりますし、またあの朝鮮日報の支出の方は、日本側が日韓関係を正常化したいという熱意があることをよく分かったと、こういう意見交換がされ
あるいは北朝鮮側から何か条件があるのかその辺がこれからのおそらく裏でのいろんな交渉それからまあモンゴリアはじめをですねあの仲介に立つ国々の協力もいただきこの問題をこの安倍内閣で解決するというのは日本にとって一つの大きな課題に今当面する一つの大きな課題でありますから安倍内閣としては必ずこれをやり遂げる覚悟であります。Well, and,、uh, and right now this, is ha- this has not been officially said. However,、uh, the media has already、uh, touched on this, saying that、uh, North Korea already has a, a name list of the abduction victims already prepared. Now the question is the timing of this disclosure.、Uh, would, and also, would North Korea put additional condition to this?、Uh, right now, there are background negotiations going on, of course, with、uh, uh, cooperation from countries such as Mongolia. And it is,、uh, and it might be possible, and we would like to have it solved within、uh, the time of our Abe administration. But, the other thing is, the Japan has a lot of people who are in the world, and the Japan has a lot of people who are in the world, and the Japan has a lot of people who are in the world, and the Japan has a lot of people who are in the world, and the Japan has a lot of people who are in the world, and the Japan has a lot of people who are in the world, and the Japan has a lot of people who are in the world. 国民的課題でもありますので、安倍内閣としてはまずこれを片付けた上で、六角協議に戻す、うん、あるいは日米間でさらに密接な協議をする、当然そういう手順を取りますので、一時もアメリカ政府がです、ね、日本が前へ進むんではないかという懸念が表明されたということを聞きましたが、そんなことは決してないのでありましてです、ね、そのご懸念はないと。このようにAnd, but that said, doesn't mean that, that Japan is uh, uh, ignoring UN, UN resolution or ignoring the six party discussion.、Uh, it does not mean that Japan has forgotten about missile and nuclear weapon issues. These things, are, of course, are being taken into consideration. However, we just see that the、uh, abduction issue is just right in front of us, and perhaps we can just you know, solve this problem. And then,、uh, of course, following the procedures that is、uh, agreed upon between, among, Uh, Japan, United States, and Korea.、Uh, some, some in the United States、uh, showed some concern that perhaps Japan is going forward alone on this and, going, and, and、uh, maybe moving forward without the rest, but that is not the concern, and I'm assured that th- th- there is no need for such concern. And as for the mention of JET program,、uh, the exchange of、uh, young people and so forth,、uh, this should be emphasized between、uh, Japan and Korea and、uh, what was called the German、uh, method and so on.、Uh, and in fact, this uh, uh, subject matter should be taken up in、uh, future summit discussions. これは小学生日本でいうと4年5年6年やったんですけど小学生後半の日中間の子どもを100人夏休みに集めまして1週間合宿をするそしてその間にお互いの国の童話を持ち寄って読み合いそしてそして別れる時には100人が10班に分かれてそれぞれの立場で童話を子どもたちが作っていくというそういうことを10年以上続けてまいりました。The idea of this was this has been going on for 10 years, but uh, uh, the elementary students from the three countries,、uh, and, and the second half of elementary in Japan, that will be fourth, fifth, and sixth、uh, grades, a、uh, hundred of them will come during summer vacation and they will stay together and they will read each other's country's、uh, children's story to, to one another. 
and then at the end uh, they would be separated into ten groups, and the and the ten groups will come up with their own children's story. No, 最初は日本だけでやっておりましたが、あの八回九回目から中国そして韓国とこう三三カ国を持ち回りでやるようになりました。Now, in the beginning, ah, uh, what place is it? あの国の場所は。Uh, in the beginning, the host country was only Japan, but、uh, after the eighth, ninth years, we have moved the host country to China and Korea. So, what do you think about the world? The world is a very important part of the world. It's 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 a very important part of the world. So, what kind of phenomena happens under these conditions? First of all,、uh, they, they do not understand each other's language. However, if when these children spend one week together,、uh, at the end of the time when it's time for them to go back to, to their own countries, they hold each other's、uh, shoulders and they shed tears to say goodbye. で彼らももう一度 OB 会として集めて別の同じ時期ですが同じ会場で別の組織で交流をするということもやっております。And then so this is、uh, the first one was over 20,、uh, 12 years ago. So the first participant children are now university students. So now we have this thing where the, they have a different group where they call them the alumni group and they will meet in the same place as the children and discuss and do the exchange. あのこれはあの政治的な動きがどうあろうとずっと続けてまいりましたまさに人事交流文化交流の一環だということで続けてきておりますしただあの SARS が流行った時一度中止したことと SARS が流行ったともう一つは今年は韓国があのセウル魚事件で子どもたちを外に修学旅行を外に出さないということになりましたので残念ながら。今回は日本は日本だけでやることになりました。それ以外はずっと性的なことを抜きにしてやるということになっています。And so this kind of personal and cultural exchange is、uh, done regardless of the situation politically among the、uh, countries. The only time that uh, this uh, has been interrupted was when there was the, the SARS issue of、uh, the disease and also with Korea's. セウル号ってあの沈没事故。あ、あ、when when the the boat was uh, uh there was a boat accident in Korea recently and the Korean government did not want their children to go abroad. So these are the only two、uh, times that not all three came. This time, so it was only Japanese, but those are the only exceptions. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much,、uh, Kang Wan with、uh, Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Uh, you both mentioned that uh, new, uh, the new collective self-defense is,、uh, is to meet regional threats, specifically from China and North Korea. And also, actually,、uh, Mr. Kalliner、uh, mentioned that it's actually driven by na、uh, Chinese nationalism. So uh, with the uh, new uh, collective self-defense, how specifically、uh, Japan plans to meet these threats from North Korea and、uh, China? And also,、uh, you mentioned that、uh, The, uh, Japan is, plan to, is planning to、uh, project a greater deterrence. How effective do you think that will be in terms of solving、uh, regional stability、uh, in Asia Pacific region? Thank you. に介入しない日本国家の意思として武力あの国際的な武力運送に関与しないという憲法の決まりがあります。専守防衛に接するという決まりがありますからその範囲の中で考えていかなきゃいけない。まあ、本格的な国連が国連憲章でいう集団的自衛権を持つ行使するならばやっぱ憲法改正という問題がございます。それに行き着くには相当まだ時間もかかるし、今すぐというわけにいきません。しかし、ご指摘のような脅威はある。したがって、日本にとって、その同盟国、特にこれはもうアメリカ
と考えていいと思いますが日本の,あの例えば朝鮮半島有事というようなケースでそれを放置すれば日本に危機が訪れる可能性が高いといった場合には日本は集団的自衛権を自衛権として行使するというのが今回の他に自衛隊を出す以外他に方法はないケースこれを想定した形での集団的自衛権ですだから国連の考えかけ集団的自衛権から言うとまだ不十分であるという指摘もあろうと思いますが今日本が取りうる憲法下での取りうるギリギリの憲法に対する解釈の変更と言えると思いますそれでまあ国民的理解を今得つつあるでしかしこれを実際に行使できるようにするにはさらに法律が必要ですからこれからの国会での議論に待たなきゃなりません。Well, of course,、uh, in the Article 9 of the Japanese uh, uh, Constitution, uh, it, we refrain or we renounce the use of uh, uh, participating in international armed conflict.、Uh, now, uh, we have uh, this uh, uh, self co、uh, collective self defense right. This is not the, the full blown one that is written in the UN Charter, but rather it is、uh, where. When there is a threat there, for example, with an ally,、uh, and in which case we think, you know, US at this point,、uh, or because of some contingency on the Korean Peninsula, if we do not do any action, we do not move to any action, that it becomes a direct, direct threat to J Japan. Under only these conditions would the self defense force move. Uh, and and this, so this is the most limited kind of、uh, collective self defense that we are trying to reinterpret for the Constitution. And,、uh, and there are those that say that's not enough, but however, this is as much as we can go right at this moment. And we are trying to get our citizens' understanding on the issue. And also, this is a, only a reinterpretation, so、uh, in order this to be actually、uh, exercised, we have to come with new legislation in the diet. Did you have anything to add to that, Chris? Yeah, I, I'd say it, <coughs> it, it's not only for regional threats, but international、um, security concerns,、uh, including UN peacekeeping operations.、Um, for example, right now,、uh, Jap Japan is precluded from having its doctors provide assistance to frontline troops.、Um, Japan can't carry U.S. bullets on their ships、uh, that might be used either for UN operations or defense of the peninsula. Um, uh, Japan, uh, Japanese tankers can't even carry fuel if it is perceived to be supporting combat operations. So, incredibly restrictive, not just for regional areas,、uh, but even in、uh, Iraq and Sudan and other issues.、Um, the collective self defense,、um, by not having it,、uh, it would. It Required UN troops to defend Japanese troops that were there to help peacekeeping operations. In Iraq, Japanese troops had to be protected by the Dutch. In the Sudan, they had to be protected by Sri Lankans. So it was a drain as, rather than an augmentation of the coalition. So by having some of these collective self defense restrictions removed or by implementing some of them,、uh, it would enable Japan to provide a more effective、uh, contribution to UN peacekeeping operations.、Um, as for whether how effective it would be in solving regional instability,、uh, you know, it, it, it takes two hands to clap.、Uh, if there's no crisis, then there wouldn't be really a perceptible change in. The Japanese self defense force posture.、Uh, many of these are in response to a crisis brought on by someone else.、Uh, so, you know, things like the Senkakus, that would be covered under Japan's ability to defend its own territory. Things on, say, the Korean Peninsula, you know, Japan right now would be precluding, precluded from helping clear mines,、uh, which would be a critical problem during、uh, providing logistic support. Um, by the US or Japan to the Korean Peninsula. So, a lot of it is still what would seem to be pretty minimal contributions, but in a Japanese context, they'd be a, a, allow a much greater contribution for the defense of、uh, areas in Asia as well as worldwide. I'm sorry, just to follow up. You just mentioned that it's specifically driven by、uh, 
threats from North Korea and China. No, I'd say it's it's long been discussed and long been urged by Washington, including you know Iraq issues, Sudan issues, uh, other security issues. Uh, what I said is it's gotten new energy. The discussion has gotten new energy in response to uh, the growing Chinese assertiveness and the Senkakus, and then also um, all Asian nations are concerned by what's going on in South China Sea too. So it it gives new life, new energy to a long-standing. Uh, discussion within Japan and a long-standing U.S. urging for Japan to assume a larger role for its own defense as well as international peacekeeping operations. Anthony Chen from the Asia Policy Point. According to Nomura Securities, a trilateral China-South Korea-Japan free trade agreement would increase Japan's GDP by 0. Uh, 0. 0.74, exceeding even the 0.54 increase anticipated by Japan's entry into the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. However, once a bilateral China-South Korea FTA excluding Japan is passed in November this year, it will, in, it will pose tremendous economic challenges to Japanese corporations in their share of China's market. So my question is, is the Japanese government making efforts to improve relations with China concerning the uh, anti-Japanese economic battles within China? Or is Japan ready to shut doors to China in the process of East Asian economic integration? Thank you. あの、そういう形で進んできておりただ、可能になってくるわけです。でも現実には可能だと思っています。しかし、あの、将来の課題としては可能である。今現実的にその問題が提起されているかというそこまでは言ってない。Okay, um, so in terms of uh, Japan and Chinese economic relation, uh, there is a lot of corporate expansion on both sides and and the economic relations is indeed large between the two countries and this relationship is not not something that we can stop even if we tried. So uh, we used to say, even if the, uh, the politics get cold between the two countries, we have to keep the economy warm. And we do not change, we have not changed that policy today. Uh, but today, when you look at it, perhaps along with the policy, the economic, economic relationship may, might have uh, become a little colder. And, uh, and so when you talk about TTP, we cannot talk to China right away through the T TTP, but uh, 
we have uh, different uh, prospects of the future economic relationship with China, for example, in agriculture. Uh, we would like to have safe food and, uh, and, and secure food. And, uh, and, and with this, when you look at this, China is uh, at the point where they are about to be uh, in a position that where they may have to import food as well. And this is an uh, outlook that we are looking and there should there could be an agricultural agreement between Japan and China. Uh, of course, uh, with China, we have to do it at the individual uh, 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 negotiation, perhaps in the style of FTA, free trade area. And uh, this is, even if, if it is not currently at the very moment going on, it is a, a, a possible future issue. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jason Chang. Uh, I'm a reporter from Yonam News Agency of South Korea. Um, it, it's been more than two years since Korea and Japan, Japan Korea held a, a bilateral summit of their leaders. And as a first step to break this deadlock, uh, I think that South Korea wants Japan to take some additional measures to resolve the comfort women issue. Uh, is there any possibility of Japan taking any additional steps about it? Or do you just believe that this issue has already been settled yeah, through the normalization treaty 50 years ago, and there is nothing Japan can do more, uh, more about it? Thank you. <coughs> あ、歴代4内閣にわたってですね、慰安婦の皆さんには、あの、軍の関与を認めた形での手紙、そして先ほど私間違えて、え、その、アジア平和基金が5000、1000ドルだったんですね。これ50000ドルの正確に間違いです
there wasn't a, th this issue was not within the discussion. We know that it came up after that uh, treaty. And so through government and also even citizen donation contribution, we have uh, compensated with apology. Uh, so can we do more? Uh, we, you know, it's not that we, we haven't found it yet, but uh, you know, we, we, I think we can. And, and please understand that we will uh, deal with this. We, it's, it's not over yet. And uh, going back to the 55 survivors, we would like to take the same measures that we have done with the others before them. これで両国間合意の上でやってきたと思っておりますが、ま、途中であの、これに対する、え、NGOと等々の反対運動が起きたりしてですね、中断をした状態だというふうに思っております。また安倍総理はこれまで内閣が取ってきた方針を変えるつ
I think as we've tended to focus not only here, but the last year on the history issue, it, it tends to, as we say, suck the air out of the room um, and ignores what otherwise are probably the best ever relations of Washington with Japan and South Korea, um, perhaps you know since uh, for many decades. With Korea, we have the, the, uh, the chorus FTA, we have uh, after the tragedies of Chonan and Yangpyeongdo, the two countries have made tremendous uh, steps forward in implementing a number of defense reforms. There's uh, any number of new agreements, new coordination. South Korea has moved forward on many uh, procurement and implementation things. The, uh, we have a common threat perception of North Korea. We, uh, we see eye to eye. That wasn't always the case in the past. On many other issues, the relationship uh, between Washington and Seoul is superb. Similarly with Tokyo. Uh, we have uh, stability in the Japanese government, and that allows Tokyo to move forward, uh, we hope. On TPP, Prime Minister Noda and Abe have taken steps forward. On defense issues, we have a new energy in Mr. Abe, who's implementing uh, many things that Tokyo has talked about for decades. Uh, yesterday at a speech at Brookings, uh, the DPJ member, Diet member, uh, Mr. Uh, Aki Nagashima, had pointed out that many of the things Mr. Abe is implementing were started by the DPJ. And that shows there's greater continuity in Japanese defense policy than, than change. And that's, that's for the good. So we have uh, a very strong support by Washington of Japan and, and under the treaty. Um, and we're moving forward on TPP. It's difficult, as any free trade agreement is. So I think you know, we need to focus sometimes on the positives of the two relationships that Washington has with our critical allies. Uh, and now we're focusing on the area that's the most uh, right now contentious, and that's trying to improve relations between our two allies. It's difficult. I think the U.S. has a role, but I think at least we can be encouraged by uh, right now the very strong relations we have with our two critical allies. Well, I really appreciate you ending on an optimistic note. Um, you know, I think generally um, we sometimes understate the complexity of all these relationships, Japan-China relations uh, in addition to uh, Japan-Korea relations and, and China's relationship with all of the, and Japan's relationship with all the countries of Southeast Asia. We, we you know, the media now moves so fast and we all, we cram so much into three or 400 words at a time now that we overlook uh, the complexity. And so I'm very grateful to Mr. Kawamura uh, to help us understand in, in greater detail um, exactly what Japan's position is on these issues and how we might be able to move forward together. Also very appreciative to Bruce's, uh, Bruce's input. He's been doing this a long time. His perspective on, on the whole issue is, is very important. So thank you all for coming out and, and contributing. I hope to see you again soon.